Greetings and hello out there. This is old brother Sal. And I say old because in a couple of weeks I'll be 82. That's why uh, my son Tony is the one who's been taking over the commentary and the teaching. But I've decided that uh, since I haven't stopped watching this process of the uh, Biblical prophecies coming to pass since 1980. But I'd like to express some of the things that I've learned over the years that might be interesting to you on a first hand basis from the person who actually did the watching and kept track of it. There's two things that I want to talk about, and that's the Bible as a whole and the prophecies, the end time prophecies, as part of that Bible. Now, I'm an eschatologist. That is, a person who studies the end time prophecies. I literally gave up my career when I was 43 years old to pursue the study that finally led to me, after 13 years, to the publishing of what I knew on the internet. I have stopped doing that for all these years, 38 years now. And it's been very interesting because right from the beginning I had an understanding that if you wanted to know about these prophetic end times, that it was about the Jews in Jerusalem that meant you had to look in the Middle East. You had to know where to look. Then you had to know what to look for. That comes out of the Word of God given to a couple of people, Daniel and the prophecies, and Revelation to John. One of the two main actors that make the revelation of what's going on possible to see because they're about historical things. So there were history, there was and is history to watch to see if these really are the end times. And you, if you didn't know where to look, then you had to know where to look, what to look for, and then you had to know why you're looking there to see it. And through that principle, I developed this method of watching time go by. And it's like watching grass grow, you know, and commenting on it and keeping track of it on a daily basis now for 38 years. Some of you might remember that I used to broadcast five days a week. Those days are long gone for many reasons, but the watch goes on, the ministry goes on. My son Tony has taken over the commentary, like I say, and the teaching. And our main interest right from the beginning was to find the truth about these prophecies. Whether or not it was worth pursuing into the future. And time has proven that it was well worth it because during that long period of time we've had an opportunity to weigh the historical facts that we have witnessed, not the political propaganda, but the historical facts, because they're now facts, because they're past tense, they have happened. We have reached milestones in these prophecies that lead us to believe that we are actually in that time, and that even though these times have happened in the past, many times over through history, because the, the prophecy that the most important part to understand is that this is not God directing it. This is God telling us what he saw from beginning to end. So he's not the overseer of it, making sure it all happens. What he did was he wrote on each and every heart of every human being ever born. 
those commandments of his. You know when you're lying. You know when you're stealing. You know if you murder somebody. You know if you're disrespectful. That's intuitive into the human spirit. You understand it completely. He just spoke it out into a law so that these people who were lawless had something to under, to back up the understanding that they already knew. So that they had not only up but down now, east and west. So there are certain things to learn that these prophecies were God telling us. This is what you people did with free will. He wrote it on our hearts and then he gave us free will to practice whatever it is we wanted. We were free. Do you understand that? Free. We could follow our heart before the Christ, the Messiah, was ever known to be that of the personage of Jesus of Nazareth, or not. It didn't make any difference. He already had the code to live by, written on his heart by God himself, into this species called man. From the beginning. So he said, here, here's the world. You need to learn the difference between good and evil because you only knew good in the beginning. When evil was introduced, the other side of the coin, don't forget, as high as good gets, giving your life for your friend, all the way to the other end, to the depth of that, same depth as it goes to height, is evil. The other side of the coin. It had to be that way, otherwise we couldn't understand the difference between good and evil. It was written on our heart. Now we knew precisely why it was written on our heart. And now man has to live in that for the infant anticipably small time of a lifetime in the whole scheme of things it make any difference whether you believe it's been going on for billions of years or whether you believe it's been going on for only 6,000 years or whatever your belief is is fine with me I'm after the truth of the matter of these prophecies and if these prophecies are true then God is who he says he is. And that's the other lesson that needs to be learned from the Bible. God says he's love. To introduce love into a, a universe that he created with all of the animals and everything that he created, he finally creates a Cognitive being, somebody who could comprehend love in the format in which he loves. Because they had nothing to compare it to. Because of that, they had to be given the opportunity for that tiny little lifetime in what is known to us as eternity to find that knowledge and choose what you wanted to do. But whatever it is that you chose, he sent a redeemer to redeem the whole world. And he made a provision in the final judgment for those who did one of the few things that he lists. When he says, he answers her question. He says, when would we ever do that for you? We don't know you. And for all those people then that don't know him. If they gave someone something to eat that was hungry or gave him a drink that was thirsty. 
as they gave him shelter, gave him clothing. Whatever they did, they did for the least of his brethren. They did it for him. And for that, they're righteous. And for that, they get the reward of those who were righteous their whole lives. It makes no difference. That's taught in the laborers that start in the morning and get the same pay as a guy who works only an hour. It's all metaphoric. It all means this is who we are. We're individual to God. It's written on our heart. It's written on our neighbor's heart. How they respond to that and to you depends on how you respond to them. And he's introducing love, so he has to have a consciousness that can understand love and creates that consciousness. Writes it on their heart. Teaches them in the garden what love is all about. And then they find out the cruelty of the other side. And we get to live a short time, 80, 90 years at the most. Most people die in their 60s and 70s. Used to be in their 50s. So you got this little tiny short time. When you grow to be an adult to understand which way you decide you want your life to go. You can't be good. God said you can't be good. Only God can be good. I don't want to turn this into a sermon. I'm trying to teach you what the lesson is of the whole darn thing. And then the timing of the prophecies to make sure that if you understand what God really wanted for you, what your existence is all about, it's about finding love because in his world nothing exists but love. He said there was faith, hope, and love. And of the three, love is the most important because if you don't have it, the rest of it's worthless. Faith is an action based on a belief and sustained with confidence. An action based on the belief that Jesus is the Messiah and he said, come and follow me. And that doesn't mean to follow money, which he said not to, that you can't do. And then justify it by saying, I believe. It's not what it says. It's not what it means. And if you're doing that, you're one of those people in the end times, like all of them except some mighty few. I don't know who they are. But the whole church is being talked to in Revelation when he tells them. He says, you know, you're wretched and miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. You got need of nothing, you say. Oh, boy, you missed it. You missed it. You chased the money and you... And all you said was you gave him the lip service, I believe. He said, now I'm giving you a chance to come back. This is that time. If we're in the end time, this is that time. And if we're in the end time, don't expect anything good to happen in the world because we're headed toward the biggest conflict and the biggest catastrophe that's ever been known on the earth, the time of trouble that has never been seen on this earth. It'll never be seen again, because after that's over with, will come that final judgment. That catastrophe is interrupted for a thousand years, but it picks right back up again. It goes to that time when that final judgment is brought about. But in the meantime, the Bible tells us clearly that the place that the souls waits in Hades, Sheol, the top level of that is paradise. 
if you're waiting in paradise because you're saved, you're eventually going to wind up in eternity when it's time. I think people don't understand is that time is involved, earthly time. I don't know how long that is in the dimensional time of God, but on earth, a thousand years is a thousand years. Boom. And we're headed to cataclysm after cataclysm. Time of peace, then another cataclysm. But before this first cataclysm that we're headed to comes to pass, we're going to get a period of what they call peace. Covenants made with many for seven years. And I guess they decide not to kill each other for a while. We call that peace. Peace will have a dividend. People won't recognize the fact that it's a false peace. Because of the dividend. Because the people are following the money. It's obvious. When you see what's going on today. That we've come to a, turn, a corner in the road. We've made a turn. We're going in a different direction right now. We're headed down that path. That is caused by this change in, in direction. Sparked in the beginning what, 17, 18 years ago with a commitment to go into the Middle East and clean out all those people. Now we're going into the Middle East looking for peace. We're going all over the world looking for peace. Peace will come because the scripture, these prophecies, lead us to understand that that's what happened. So if we're not going to make this peace, then this is not the time. And you needn't fret over that. What you need to do is you understand you've got more time to start spreading the love that you're supposed to understand is who God is. He's not a vengeful God, as you put it, in the Christianity world. The Christianity world has got a concept that's not correct. Their concept is that you just have to believe. And that's true. Because you won't act in favor of that belief if you don't believe. But it's that action. And it only calls for one action in your one minuscule little lifetime. You're giving somebody something to eat who's hungry or something to drink, something to wear visiting them in jail or visiting them in the hospital, that turns you into the righteousness of Christ. Because you did act on that belief. If only once you're righteous. But if you don't follow him, if you don't love your neighbor, if you don't love God above all things, and love your neighbor like you love yourself, and give, 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 give in order to receive, because you're going to receive back a multitude over what you give, because <laughs> that's how it works. But we don't believe that, so we don't do it. We follow the money because we think that money is the key. God rewards us with a lot of money, then we must be good. The opposite is true. You can have all the money you want. It's what you do with it to show your love that counts. You think God gave it to you. Well, the world gave it to you. You know, God gave you free will to do what you want. You want to make a deal and it's illegal as hell and you do it and you make a lot of money and then you turn straight? That's okay. That's between you and God. This is an individual proposition here. Religion tries to make it a corporate proposition, and it's not. It has nothing to do with the masses except on an individual basis that make up the masses. When you got that straight, then you can start to understand 
how these prophecies actually affect you in the real time and what the signs of the times are that Jesus said to them at that time. You could read those signs, just like the signs of the weather. It's no big deal if you know where to look, what to look for, and why you're looking there to see it, and that's what I've always thought. The lesson of the scriptures, as far as Christianity is concerned, is to learn that lesson. Trust in him. Trust that what he told you was the truth. That if you live that way, he will take care of you. Not if you just believe in him, which you need to do, because faith is an action based on that belief. And sustained with confidence, that you can be confident because you're living that life and it absolutely is as he said it would be. Even with the ups and downs, with the turmoils and the travails and all of the things, because he had them, you're going to get them. Doesn't make any difference. You can have all the money in the world, still have more problems than you can handle, and you kill yourself because of it. That's got nothing to do with anything, does it? Not in the spiritual world. It's a shame in the real world. If a person kills themselves, they just take their problems and pass them on to the people who are alive. So, the idea is to learn that love is what counts. Love is the only thing he judges you by. Your works speak for themselves, and in that final judgment, those who have to face it, because they haven't already faced the judgment seat of Christ. These people that come after this, into this millennium stuff, after the millennium, they're not going to know Jesus anymore as the Savior. <laughs> The Savior's come and gone. We're into another era now. We're in the, the era of his rule that comes. These people try to bring down on him. It takes a long time for them to gather these folks. Not a matter of months. It's just Think of the concept of a thousand years when you get to live 80 in your lifetime, maybe. Plus or minus. A thousand years. It's a thousand lifetimes. More. So, think of the things that have happened just during your lifetime. Multiply that now times hundreds of lifetimes. No. There's a lesson for you individually to learn. There's a decision that you as an individual make about your life and how you want to live. How you choose to believe and what you think your rewards are and all of those things are really do not affect the core belief that Jesus is the Messiah. And when you investigate it thoroughly, you find what Messiah means, you know, what that salvation is that he brought. He paid the price, the full price, the propitiation, as it's spoken of in Scripture. He paid the full price for everyone. You know. That damnation is... encapsulated at the end into one single act that makes you righteous in that final judgment so that it can move on into history. And what goes up in flames is the old way. It doesn't move on because it gets burned up like the garbage in the garbage pit of history. He set out to forgive everyone. 
Some had to wait a long, 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 long time in Sheol in order to get to that final judgment. You see. And during that time, of course, they're contemplating and understanding why they're where they are. With that hope and that understanding that it will come to an end. In earth years, on earth, that brings it about, that completes the plan, that now can move into this eternity that we can't understand on our level of thinking. It just doesn't make sense whatsoever what eternity is and how we would live in the spirit world or whatever. We're going to have our bodies back. It's going to be here on earth. What does that all mean? You know, that's yet to be seen. It's not, I mean, it's a fact that it will be if it's a fact that these are prophecies are coming to pass and it's happening as it says. You see, that verifies the future. Now, as a personal chronicler of these events for the past 38 years, I have a strong suspicion that we have turned that corner into, onto, into the final leg now. And I think that was the the action of verifying Jerusalem as the capital of Israel by placing our by keeping the promise made thirty years ago that we would do that. And now with this turn of events, in a time when they the world has picked up a leader who is in the terms of the matrix that we live in now, because there's the other side of that matrix, the people who, are, who have got us in this matrix. The world lives in an illusion of uh, that can really be seen now in its entirety because the propaganda is so heavy now. It is just absolutely nothing but propaganda day after day after day after day on the same subject matter because they're trying to stop this movement, this peace that's coming, because the people that don't want it, they want, if they don't want peace, they want war. You see, and they come up with this temporary peace, the covenant with many for seven years, that gets broken in the middle, and you can understand why, if you watch history, you can understand how everybody's chopping at the bit right now. the last several years we've been arming the world. We've been getting it ready for a real war. But right now we're trying to make peace. The warmongers are screaming and the peaceniks don't believe it. And none of them understand that it's in the overall scheme of things of the people who are actually running the show that you never know because they're the people who control the money and the power and everything else through the through the financing of course you can't do anything without financing they're allowing this to happen right now they want this to happen because this brings you to the happy ending that the the jews who are the predominant now feature of the end times because Christianity is becoming illegal almost. People are dropping that like you can't believe. The Catholics are up in arms and many of them are calling for the Pope to resign over the what's going on in that end of the Christian religions. Or Christian sects. And so they you have this time of trouble beginning. Like it says, these are the birth pangs. These are the things that happen like when your water first breaks before you go into labor. We're living through that process right now, but is this the time? Will these things come about? Well, stay tuned because history is happening one day at a time every day. 
And if you know what to look for and where to look for it, boy, you're just sitting there happier than a clam because you know where you are. And you'll see the sign that it's actually going to happen when they decide to get together and make this covenant with many for seven years because that's on the agenda sometime in the future. That's part of this prophecy. In the midst of that week, all hell's going to break loose. The Jews are going to get their temple. That's what this is all about. That rulership from Jerusalem. That these kingdom now people who are really the people that uh, are the kind of thinking that's causing this globalization and and world dominance so they have their kingdom now that they can hand over to God that they've conquered for him which is not the intention of God at all his intention was to come back and reclaim his First claim is the Messiah. He comes back and keeps his word. However that plays out, that's the picture. Prophecy is nothing more than a picture painted by God to show us in living color on the stage of history what we brought upon ourselves with our free will. We allow these people to do this. Although they're few in number and we're many in number, we do nothing to stop them. Why? Because they keep the people, they keep the masses in chaos and hatred, especially now this hatred, because they're going to ask you to go kill people. They're going to go ask you to go kill Muslims. Why? Well, because they're against the Jews. That's nonsense. Those radical people have stolen the truth. And it's far from the truth now. They got the patriotism in America being rebuilt, the army and military being rebuilt. Already the strongest. If we had nothing left, we'd still be stronger than anybody else on earth. But we're building it to ten times strength. Why? <laughs> to keep the peace? No, to dominate, to win. And the Zionist plan of winning is being fostered right now. Because the Zionist plan brings them what they want. And then when they have rule and governance, the Zionists are going to be double-crossed. Frankly, the prophecy says they're going to kill down to the man. A certain amount of them, they're going to flee into the desert over there to Jordan and hide there for three and a half years. Well, that's all coming in the future. When? I don't know. Look how long it takes to do anything. But right now we're trying to make peace. We're trying to make get the peace around the world as the theme for the next time period. While the warmongers are just propagandizing you to death to try and get you to hate your neighbor. Because the idea of God is to love your neighbor and they don't want God in the picture anymore. They want chaos. They want it around the world. And they've got a leader in the world now that is showing the strength that it takes from a business point of view to whip a world into shape financially. Because when you're financially stable, there isn't any need for war. If you're trading straight across with no trade barriers and no uh, tariffs, well, you got free trade, real free trade. You got fair trade, and then all of a sudden your markets will flourish even more and they'll have meaning besides being propped up by the government. Because business can't stay propped up by anybody. Business has to make it on its own or it fails. And right now the country is being run by a businessman who understands the principles of it. <laughs> and is whipping it into shape. He doesn't pay a damn bit of attention to these people that are against him because there's nothing those people can do except have their representatives become a 
blocking force, an obstruction, so that he can't get anything done, but he's plowing right through that stuff because the the world needed it. If it didn't pull out of where it was, it was going to crash. And it's not that he can't crash yet. But I think we're in the midst of this prophecy right now, this prophecy that is leading to the prosperity that is brought by peace so that they can have a reason to not kill each other until something happens that causes them to break that peace. When everybody thinks it's just hunky-dory, something goes wrong. We know that has a time period, three and a half years of prosperity and then three and a half years of anguish. And we're all leading to that time, the time of trouble that never has been seen on this earth before. And right now is the preparation for that and all this chaos and tomfoolery with all this hate that they're spreading. You know, that's an old magician's trick, you know. You make them look at your left hand while you're doing something with your right hand. Houdini was able to get an elephant off the stage right in front of him. When they were circled all the way around them in the middle of a Barnum and Bailey's circus ring. Don't believe the propaganda. Stop watching your televisions. Your televisions are killing you. Especially if you're looking from your cup, if you approach it from the liberal side, that's your right. I listen. <laughs> it's written on your heart. I don't have to tell you. I'm not here to preach to you. I'm not here to tell you to come to Jesus. It's not my mission. I'm out here to find out if these prophecies are true for my own personal selfishness. Because when I'm satisfied that these prophecies are the truth, then I know that I have wasted my life following the heart that I believe showed me the way to the Messiah. Well, that's my business. That's for me. I can't fix it for you. you got to fix it. It's written on your heart already, so you don't need to have me tell you what to do or judge you in any way, shape, or form. Because not my, not my business. I, I don't judge. People want to do what the Bible says not to do. That's their choice. Not for you to come out and criticize them and tell them if they don't know Jesus, they're going to hell for sure. You don't know that. <laughs> You don't know nothing. The only thing you know is where your heart is. And if your heart's out there seeking to judge other people's hearts, well, then your heart's in the wrong damn place. That's not the lesson of Scripture. Scripture has an overall lesson. And that lesson is love. It was shown to you in the anger of God at the time that it was, anger was necessary in order to enforce the law that he gave them. But that didn't mean he damned them to hell. It means it was the process of learning what it was that he was teaching. In the Egypt situation, in that part of the story, he was teaching who God, who he was. Pharaoh wanted to let him go. He said, oh, no, not yet. <laughs> no, not yet. He said, why? So that they know that I'm God. Not you, me. And they'll forever know it. Who? His chosen people to bring that word to the world. What did they do? They caved. They caved. They brought their own traditions into it. Jesus had to tell them, you void the word of God by your traditions. What were their traditions? Their traditions was not Torah. Torah was part of it. It was the Talmud. 
all the stuff they learned in Babylon that they put into the word. Jesus told them, you know, I didn't break any of Moses' laws. You did. You made void the word of God by your traditions, by the God that you're supposed to be serving, that you agreed to do. You've broken the trust. You've led your people astray. You make them believe the wrong things. Now we have it happening again, of course. Why wouldn't it? It's how you destroy the church. That's how your devil comes into the picture, makes you go against what's written on your heart, makes you believe that you're doing the right thing by going against what's written on your heart, which leads to conflict. Away from what God asks. 180 degrees in the other direction. The other side of the coin. Not love, hate. They're openly preaching hate today. If that's not the sign that is in this end times, then nothing is. How can it get any worse? How can hate get any worse than hate in the future? This is the hate that brings on that time of trouble as it's never seen before. We're in for a ride, but we're going to get this little three and a half years of that seven-year covenant with many where they're going to call it peace. It's going to bring prosperity, but it's a lie. And believe me, it's not God telling that lie. It's the people. Because it's the people who run the earth. It's not God who runs the earth. It's the people. It's Satan who has become the prince of the power of the air. And he's the father of lies. And you believe in the lies. And God said you would. Why? Because the truth sounds like a fairy tale in the modern days. It was stumbling block to the Jews and nonsense to the Gentiles. We're back to that, or we're still there. It's a stumbling block to the Jews. They don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. There's nonsense to the Gentiles, and they're proving it. Because the churches themselves are corrupt. Not all of them. But something's going wrong in the Catholic Church. It's been going wrong for a long, long time. Many Christian denominations have teachers that are in it only for the money. Passing along a traditional religion that Hasn't got anything whatsoever to do with the word. Except in selected parts. And so the message that I have about the Bible is you should really pay attention to it as far as what God wants out of you in your little puny lifetime. Time seems like a long time. It seems like I've been alive a long time. A couple of weeks, if I make it, I'll be 82. My expiration date's coming up. You don't, I don't know how long I'm going to live. Nobody does, but uh, they start to drop like flies when they get in their late 80s, I'll tell you that. So the Understanding is, is that during that lifetime, you're here to suffer the trail travails of life, to enjoy the pleasures, enjoy the travails, bring about 
your own destiny because it's written on your heart so you choose which way you want to go then you live that life even though you can't live it all the time it's impossible because you're human and you're built with this dual nature and you succumb to it there's no problem with that the idea is to be on the road to that future that was promised because you accepted it and you're working toward it and you're working toward it by loving your neighbor as much as you can as often as you can, you display that love, you work for that love, you die for that love. And in the end, when those books are opened, that book of life has already been handled. Those books that are opened are for those people who didn't know Christ. And in those books are their works. And if one of those works stands out as one of those things that he fed someone or clothed someone or gave them something to drink, they're righteous. You don't have to fear that book being opened, that you're going to be judged by your works. Because one of those works, and maybe only one time in that 80-year career, did you give somebody something to eat? or drink, or clothe them, visit them in the hospital, bring them comfort in some way in jail. Yeah. You're as righteous as King David. King David was a murderer. But he was righteous. Moses. Righteous. By his own works? No. Made righteous by his faith. Faith was what? Action based on belief, sustained with confidence. That kind of faith. Pistus. Then the Greek. Put an A in front of it. Ah, pistus. And that's faith in the wrong direction. That's where the church is today. They got the faith. They believe in the wrong direction. They think that's all they have to do. They think that God's given them money because of their faith. No. Man's giving you money because of your work. And if your work was honest, you got that to your credit. If your work was dishonest, you know, the shame is to your credit, to you. You're credited with the shame. That mean you're going to hell forever? Nope. You have to stand for that, what you did. Yes. The judgment going to be fair? Absolutely. Is it banishment and death forever? No. It's righteousness because Christ made it available. Period. And whatever that brings, whatever eternity brings, we don't know. You can make up anything you want. You have no idea. Whatever it is, it's going to last forever. And you're going to be part of it. And I don't think it's meant to be misery. It's meant to be lovely. So it's going to be a lovingly lovely time whereas right now we're about to experience a time of trouble as there never was and we're at the beginning of it we're in the birth pangs of that trouble that's to come and it begins with this covenant with many for seven years that makes what they call a peace which will bring a dividend because there's always a dividend of peace what that dividend is is going to remain to be seen, but it's going to make people happy because they're very unhappy when this peace gets broken. Well, that's what I have to say for this week. I hope to do this at least on a weekly basis. I haven't been able to do this for years because I've given over the reins of the teaching. But to Tony, but what I think is, is that my thoughts uh, might be worthy to have also because I've learned a lot over these 82 years. 
especially over the last 38 years that I have been studying and keeping track of what's going on in the world. You might want to try out my book. Uh, we published it back in 2007, I think, that book. But it was right on, and it leads to the places that we were talking about in the book. The title of the book is uh, The Hidden Truth About the End Times. You just drop me a note right from the Rosal channel there where you're listening to this, and I'll send you a copy of it. And uh, until next week, I thank you for listening. And uh, God bless you all. And if you want to help this ministry continue for Christ, we have a donate button up on the corner there. And we thank you for that too. Until I see you again, have a great day in Christ.